If you have your copy of God's Word, please turn to Romans chapter 3. It's on page 941 of your Black Pew Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, that Bible is now your Bible. It's a free gift from Oak Grove Baptist Church. We simply ask that you read it and obey it. Heard a story about a brother and sister who got into a fight. And they were arguing and going back and forth. Finally, it got physical. The sister pinched him. She, she pushed him down to the ground. She jumped on top of him, pulled his hair and the mother walked in and broke him up and said, Girl, what are you doing? Explain yourself. She said, Well, the devil made me do it. <laughs> she said, The devil made you pinch him, push him down, and pull his hair. She said, Well, the devil made me pinch him and push him down, but pulling his hair was my idea. <laughs> As such is life. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, and I don't want you to put your hands up. I just want you to think to yourself. Answer it in your head. Do you believe that people are basically good? Not perfect, but basically, people are good. Now, if, if your answer, your internal answer is yes, then you are certainly agree with the vast majority of the world about what they think of people. Uh, because if you go out and you talk to people and you mention words like sin, oh, no, 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 people are basically good. There's good in everyone. They're, that's, that's what you'll hear. But realistically, the Bible tells us that that's incorrect. The Bible tells us that we are generally bad. You see, we are not good people who occasionally say and do and think bad things. We're really bad people who occasionally do and say and think good things. Now, if you don't agree with that, let me throw some things out there for you to ponder. Okay, why do you think there's so many laws on the books? Hmm, let me ask you this. How many of you, and don't raise your hands, God knows that we don't need to know. Let's say you know that if the speed limit is 65 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. You know. You know that you can go 9 to 10 miles over that. I'm not advocating it. Listen, follow the laws. But every one of us knows that there is a cushion where a police officer, my dad was one of them, won't pull you over if you're in that cushion. Because if they did, all they would do is write tickets and go to court. And so we, we drive 75 or 74 miles an hour. Now, what if the law said, okay, you know what, everybody's doing this. We're just going to change the speed limit to 75 miles an hour. You'd say to yourself, well, now I'm finally a law-abiding citizen. No, you would go 85 miles an hour. <laughs> and I probably would too. I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here and act like, like I'm something. I'm not. Uh, how many of you lock your doors at night? How many of you have, have ring cameras and, and, and security systems? And you, ask, you know why? Because people are basically bad. And just to throw this out, look at our form of government we have. We have three branches. We have a legislative, a judicial, and an executive branch. Now, our founding fathers didn't just go willy-nilly and come up with this, this three-pronged government. Uh, they specifically put them there for checks and balances. Now, why do you think we need checks and balances? Well, James Madison, one of the chief architects of the Constitution, said this, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administ administrated by men over men, a great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the peoples is no doubt the primary control of the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. I love that term, auxiliary precautions. Do you know why they're needed? Because people are not angels. Because all of us are basically bad and not good. You know, again, we're not good people who occasionally do bad. We are bad people who more than occasionally, uh, we are, I should say, we are bad people who try to do good. Uh, we know Jesus said no man is good. Uh, and so, yes, we should try to live righteous lives, but we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to get to that 
today. Now, we've been in a series of sermons called Translate, a Simple Guide to Big Words. And we've looked at, at regeneration, repentance, and conversion. Now, today, rather than focusing on one definition, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that actually addresses multiple big words that are essential for us to understand. Words like righteousness, justification, redemption, propitiation. Now, some of you are sitting there and saying, well, why not do a sermon on each one of those? Uh, well, because the Apostle Paul wrote a beautiful paragraph in the book of Romans that touches on each and every one of these aspects. He put them all together in one beautiful little package. One scholar said this may be the most important paragraph written in the history of mankind. Somebody else said that this, this scripture is not only the heart of Romans and the heart of the New Testament, it is actually the heart of the very Bible. It's ground zero for our spiritual universe. Martin Luther called these verses the chief point of the whole Bible. Now that should get your attention, whether you read the Bible or not, whether you believe the Bible or not. Because Paul sets out to answer the question, if mankind is inherently bad, how can we be made good again? And the answer is found in one word that isn't hard to define, and that is grace. Grace is the free gift of salvation offered to everyone who puts their faith and trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to save them. That's what grace is. It is a free gift from God. It is something that we do not deserve. It is something that we cannot earn. It is something that we cannot pay back. And it's something that we can't buy. And so in this magnificent letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, he makes the case for grace. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3. It's on page 941 of your Black Pew Bible. It should be up on your screen. And if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this, this beautiful scripture that tells us that although we are red like scarlet because of our sins, we can be washed whiter than snow through our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, this is the greatest news that we've ever heard. So, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be here with us today, both guest and host. I pray that your Spirit will reside in this room and in the hearts of all those who have said yes to Jesus. Father, I pray that that Holy Spirit will do what only he can do, that he will turn dark hearts to the light of Jesus today. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, what makes this passage so interesting and vital and important is that it describes the best deal ever offered in the history of the world. It's offered to everyone. It can be accepted anytime at any place. Paul is acting here like a prosecuting attorney. All right? in, in Romans, the first two chapters, he has set up the fact that mankind is sinful, and that we have no excuse, that we stand before God without an excuse, because God has revealed himself to us in such a mighty way. And now he is revealing himself through his son, Jesus Christ. See, the case is God versus humanity. He's bringing the entire human race before God, and he is bringing an indictment against the entire human race. And see, today we're going to go to a religious altar, we're going to go to a courtroom, and we're going to go to a marketplace to find out just why this is the best deal anytime, anywhere, any place. First thing we see is that sin identifies. In the first part of chapter 3, Paul has been building a case against every category of people in the human race uh, to tell us that we are all in need of the grace of God because all of us spiritually hit a wall when we try to be good enough for God. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, 
Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now, the righteousness of God simply means to be right with God, to have a right standing with God for God to see us as righteous. We cannot get to heaven on our self-righteousness. We can only get there through the righteousness of Jesus. But when we say yes to Jesus and he comes into us, he washes us clean and he gives us he gives us that righteousness. See, nobody can be righteous without God. Uh, no one can be righteous with God by keeping the, the commandments because all of us have broken the commandments. And James says that if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. And I know from, for a fact I have broken the Ten Commandments because I've broken one. And, and being a transgressor of one makes me a transgression, transgressor of all. So Paul tells us this, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So he unseals the indictment against us. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. And that all includes you. That all includes me. That all includes everybody. But the great thing is, is that John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, we got a decision to make. We're all sinners. We all need Jesus. And it's only through Jesus that we can be made righteous. It is only through Jesus that we can be saved because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. See, we know that there is something wrong with us. We know that sin has distorted us. We are made in the image and likeness of God. My Wednesday night Bible study, we're going through Genesis. Uh, we we're in week four, and we're finally making it to chapter three because we're, we're really, really wading through it. And, and we went through how God created Adam and Eve and, and how, how mankind was made with intellect, emotion, and will in the image of God. And I'm not going to spoil it for my class, but Adam spoils it. We're going to get to that this week. Lord willing. But we are all sinners. And listen, we live in a day and age where, where the, the worst sin you can do is call somebody a sinner. The worst thing you can do is tell somebody that they're doing wrong because they don't like that. That's not very nice. There are even preachers on TV that I would suggest you not watch because they will not use the word sin. Jesus came to die for sinners. If you eliminate the word sin from our vocabulary then you eliminate the need for Jesus Christ not only to be born, but to die. Amen. Amen. We can't do that. The Greek verb, hamartia, means to fall short, but it's in the present tense. And it means it's something we do continuously. In other words, every human being from every race and rank, every creed, color, the irreligious, the religious, the good, the bad, are sinful, guilty, and without excuse before God. We're all in the same boat. We all have the same problem. We've all made the same mess. We are sinners, and we sin every day. We continuously fall short of the goodness, the greatness, and the glory of God. And so the big question is, how can a sinful me be right with a sinless God? How do we break through? Well, we have to understand this. We have to understand sin, because if we don't understand sin, we're never going to understand the Bible the gospel, we're never going to understand our need for God, and we're never going to understand how we can get right with God, because sin identifies every one of us. We're all falling short, and we have all fallen short. The evidence is overwhelming, and the verdict is clear. We are guilty unless God intervenes. There can be no negotiation. There's no plea bargaining. We need a Savior, because sin identifies us. Second, God justifies us. Now, we're getting ready to get into some very deep waters of biblical truth, and hopefully you're going to see just how amazing God's grace is, how deep God's love is, and how marvelous God's salvation is. Because the first place we're going to visit is a place that I certainly don't want to be, and you probably don't want to be. It would be a courtroom. Verse 24, and we are justified by his grace as a gift. Now, let's stop at that word, justified. Justification is a big word. It's one of the longest words in the New Testament. It's absolutely one of the greatest and most important words of the Christian faith because from the beginning of time, a courtroom has been used for two purposes, uh, to acquit the innocent and to condemn the guilty. 
And so the picture is clear. After hearing all this evidence, the judge decides that a person is not guilty of the offense alleged against him, then he should be declared not guilty. And that's what that word justified means. It means not guilty. Now, we know that a judge should never declare a man innocent if he knows him to be guilty, and he should never declare a man guilty if he knows him to be innocent. Nobody likes that. God doesn't like that. Proverbs 17, 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Now that brings up a problem. If that's all that God's word said about justification, it would be a word that we would wish was never in the Bible because we've already seen that we are guilty and we are all condemned. We're not innocent. The evidence is indisputable, and yet we read these words that we are justified freely by his grace. The gavel drops, the judge looks at you, and you're waiting for him to drop the hammer when he says, not guilty. How can this be? There's no new evidence, but we have no alibi, there's no extenuating circumstances, Uh, we're not going to get off on a technicality. How do we walk away scot-free? So don't be fooled, because justification is not an easy thing to do. We know that guilty people sometimes are found innocent because the evidence doesn't convict them. A judge may find you guilty or not guilty, but a judge cannot justify anyone. Because justification erases any record of anything you have ever done wrong. It expunges your record. It's just like your sin never, ever occurred. You see, our record shows that we've all done something wrong. Uh, A president can pardon someone, but even a president cannot reinstate a criminal to the position of someone who has never broken the law, and yet that's what God does for us when he justifies us. He pronounces the guilty innocent, and he wipes the slate clean. Have you ever had a, a flooded basement? I'm sure there are a lot of things worse. But that is one of the worst things that can ever happen. Uh, Hurricane Floyd hit in 1999. It's funny to say 19. (laughs) Uh, Had a foot of water in my basement. Lost power for four days. Some pump went out. And and here here come the water. How high is the water, mama? Three feet high and rising. And it was rising. And and finally, when when I got a generator and got that out of there, I had a disgusting, smelly, stinky basement uh, and, and I took care of it myself because I don't hire men to do things I think I can do. Uh, so it took a while uh, before the house stopped smelling like a, a foot. Uh, and what I should have done, I saw the commercial for Serve Pro, I should have called them up because their motto is, like it never even happened. What'd you tell that story for, Jim? Because Jesus, through justification, makes it just like it never even happened. Because he restores us through through his blood and through his salvation. Justification is just as if we'd never sinned. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Is anybody excited about that? That that Jesus makes all things new? Hallelujah, I am. Praise God. And what that means is that you don't have to live where you used to be. Jesus will take you just as you are, but he doesn't leave you that way. And so when you come to Christ and you still sit around and you say, oh, I'm so guilty over the things I used to do. He has forgiven you. Forgive yourself. Tell Satan to hit the road. He's whispering in your ears. And get busy for the Lord Jesus. Because that's what holds too many Christians back. It's what holds Christians back from growing spiritually. Oh, I am not worthy. You sound like Wayne and Garth. Some of you are old enough to know what that means. Of course we're not worthy, because Christ Jesus had to die to free us. Christ Jesus had to go through hell to justify us. He does it freely. No big attorney's fees, no bribing the judge. Uh, Retribution paid freely by his grace. And again, you know what grace is? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And that raises another question. If we deserve justice, and justice demands condemnation, and God is a just judge, how do we deserve, how do we who deserve condemnation receive justification? 
And so that leads us to two other places we have to go, a marketplace and a religious altar, because those places are where we find that while sin identifies and God justifies, it is Jesus who satisfies. When something is free, it doesn't cost us anything. But this is the next amazing thing we discover. The reason why our justification is free and costs us nothing is because it costs Jesus everything. And so as we leave the courtroom for a moment, we go to the marketplace, verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, do you remember why we were in the courtroom to begin with? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. We are all condemned. But we're not just sinners. We're also slaves. We are slaves to sin. Long before governments offered poverty assistance programs, if a person fell into debt, they could lose all of their land, they could become completely destitute, uh, totally impoverished, and the only possible means of avoiding either jail or starvation was to sell yourself into slavery in exchange for the debt to be repaid. Uh, and that's happened all throughout history. Or you could be born into slavery or forced into slavery. Regardless of how you become a slave, the only way to get your freedom was to be redeemed. Either someone had to pay off your debt, or even if you owed no debt, that person would have to offer to pay enough to purchase your freedom. And that's where the term redemption comes from. We are redeemed by Jesus. See, uh, redemption is a commercial term that comes out of the marketplace. Just as justification is a legal term just that comes out of the courtroom. And the truth of the matter is, every single one of us are born into slavery. Our master is sin. We are natural-born sinners, born into spiritual slavery under the nomination of sin. And just like any other slave, we have no means and we have no ability to free ourselves. Jesus Christ redeemed us. He bought us out of captivity, shedding his own blood as the payment for our sins. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. But wait. There's still more that had to be done. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So now we leave the marketplace. We go to the religious altar. That word propitiation, as some Bibles say, the sacrifice of atonement. Jesus was our atonement. You remember in the Old Testament, they used to sprinkle the, 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 the heifer's, the lamb's blood on the mercy seat on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Jesus is our atonement. Jesus is our propitiation. Some people don't like that word. Uh, there are even theologians who use the term uh, expatiate. Uh, they don't like propitiation because propitiation when applied to God, literally means to placate someone's anger. And they don't want to view God as an angry God. Because some people say, well, the God of the Old Testament was angry, and the God of the New Testament is gracious. Uh, the same God that created Gen uh, uh, the world in Genesis 1-1 is the same God who recreates everything in Revelation 22. Uh, God is timeless. God is eternal. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a start. He doesn't have an ending. Uh, and, and it's the same God. So th this, this, this propitiation that Jesus offers to us assuages the wrath of God. Jesus is paying our debt. There was a debt that our sin incurred, and through his blood that he shed, he satisfies the wrath of God. He propitiates that wrath. And we've already established that God is a loving God, and he will and should be angry with sin because sin hurts his creation, and sin hurts people that he loves the most. There's nothing we can do to satisfy that anger. There is nothing we can do to remove the wrath of God on evil and sinfulness. Uh, where there is the wrath of God, uh, it is joined with the love of God, and listen to how this happens. Normally, in any case that comes before a court, if a judge is also the offended party, he must recuse himself. Because a judge cannot preside over a case where he is effectively the plaintiff. And yet, in this situation, God is not just the judge. He is not just the prosecuting attorney. He is also the plaintiff. Now, you know why? I told you last week. Because sin is always first against God. If you cheat on your taxes, your sin, first primarily, is not towards the government, it's against God. 
If you commit adultery, your sin first and foremost is not against your spouse, it is against God. If you have a racist attitude, your first offense is not necessarily towards that race, it is against God, because we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And in Christ we are all one. So here's the dilemma again. God wants to justify us, even though we are guilty. And as the judge, he must see that justice is done. As the plaintiff, he has the right to satisfaction. Jesus steps in as the propitiation for our sins. He satisfies God's wrath. He sees that justice is carried out, and he assures that the sin is totally paid for. Because of Jesus, there is total satisfaction. He did that at the cross. When Jesus said, to tell us day, it is finished, it was finished. In the courtroom, he accepted the punishment of our sins. In the marketplace, he paid the price for our freedom. And at the religious altar, he took the pain of God's wrath. When you look at the cross, you see everything. You see the greatest evidence of the love of God. You see the greatest evidence of the justice of God. We see the place where the wrath of God and the mercy of God meet because of the grace of God. We have to go to the cross because the cross is the point of the Christian life. The cross is the center point of our salvation. The resurrection is the linchpin of our eternal life. And and these words, yes, they're big. And some of you might say, this is boring. It's not boring to me. Because I want to hear that even though I, I, I was filthy with sin, Jesus will wash me. And Jesus will accept me that I can be restored to a right relationship with God the Father. And that I can spend eternity with him. Amen. Amen. Simply put, the love of God that satisfied the wrath of God came through the Son of God. And God doesn't love us because Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us because God loves us. God's wrath needed to be propitiated, and God's love did the propitiating. (laughs) Why was it done this way? Verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in God. Now, how is it possible for a righteous God to declare unrighteous to be righteous without compromising his righteousness or condoning our unrighteousness? See, God can be just in his righteousness. He can justify the unrighteous at the same time because at the cross, justice was done. The wrath of God was satisfied. The price was paid. And all this has been done for us. All we have to do is accept the verdict. We enter into freedom, and we live in perfect, peaceful relationship with God. And how do we do that? Well, three times in this passage, Paul uses the word faith. All you have to do is take all that God has done for you by faith. Justification is by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone. And this is really the heart of the gospel. This is really the, the, what, what, the, what is unique to Christianity, that God stepped down from heaven, that he became like one of us, yet sinless, that he died for us. There's no other religion in the world that promises to free forgiveness and eternal life to those who don't deserve it and, in fact, have done everything not to deserve it. It's all by faith. There's nobody so good that they don't need to take this deal, and there's nobody so bad that it's not offered to them. It's on the table for everybody. But the deal is exclusive and it's inclusive. Only those who believe can receive this deal. But everyone who believe will receive it. You see, the dam of our sin can never stop the flood of God's grace. Where sin flows, grace overflows. Where sin reigns, grace floods. When sin meets grace, sin always loses and grace always Wins. And here's the bottom line, Romans 5, 17. For if, because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. See, in Adam, we're all born losers, but we can all be born again winners in Jesus. Everybody in the world is in one of two places. Either you're in Adam or you are in Jesus. Either you're under the law or you're under grace, and the question you have to answer today is, where are you? Now, we all remember the little poem, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. 
At the beginning of time, Adam had the greatest fall of all, and he made all of us Humpty Dumpties. But listen to this biblical version of the poem. Jesus Christ came to our wall. Jesus Christ died for our fall. He killed Queen Death and crushed King Sin through grace, put us all back together again. We are, we are all born losers, but through grace, faith, and Jesus, we don't have to stay that way. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the love, the mercy, the redemption, the propitiation, the atonement, the justification that you offer to us freely. But Lord, you paid so very much for it. We thank you for this good news of the gospel, that sinful man can be reconciled to a holy God through our faith in Jesus Christ alone. Lord God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today, some of whom may want to share the gospel, but they're struggling with some of these big words, and they're, they're a little intimidated by them, and, and Satan whispers at them, oh, you're going to get caught up in something you can't explain. You're, you, you don't know enough. You're not smart enough. Listen, Lord, if, if they've been saved, Lord, you know that they have the power of the Holy Spirit in them and that they can do great things through you. So I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here today. I pray for those here who don't know you as Savior. I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict their hearts, that they will see through your word that they are sinners, that they have been separated from you by that sin. And it's only through faith and trust in Jesus that they can have that relationship restored. I pray that today would be the day that they would cry out to you, Lord, save me. That they would lay their burdens, their cares, and their sins at the altar, at the foot of the cross. That they would turn from those sins and turn to the Savior, Jesus Christ, where they will find everlasting life, abundant life, and peace, hope, and joy. So God, we just commit this time of invitation to you and pray that your spirit flows freely among us, Lord, comforting those who need comforting and convicting those, Father, who need convicting. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If the spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you want to be justified this morning, you're a slave to sin and you want to be redeemed. You want to be set free. Jesus has already died as a propitiation for your sin. He has already assuaged the wrath of God and he offers that free gift of eternal and abundant life to you freely through his grace. All you have to do is have faith in that. Our staff will be down front. We'd love to receive you. We'd love to pray with you and celebrate uh, your salvation with you today. Maybe you need to be baptized. We're doing baptism next Sunday. Uh, if you need to be baptized, let us know. If, if you would like to join our church, let us know. If you just are hurting today and you need somebody to pray with you, please come as the Spirit moves you.